Hello, everyone. I'm Joel Baird, the general manager of Missoula Community Access Television. And I'm Kim Anderson. I'm on the board of MCAT, and I'm also the director of programs and grants for Humanities Montana. We want to welcome you to this. I think it's the second show of the year. You were in Lewiston for the... I'm, uh, I oh, I missed anyway, the renewed. first show of 2020. Kim had the night off the last time. <laughs> uh, it is Previous January engagement. 27th. Yes. It's a beautiful spring-like Monday. My lilacs are starting to bud. The foolish, this is not foolish good. This things. Is not good. So for MCAT's news, we're going to get on. We have a full lineup of guests yeah. for Missoula Live today. Um, I would like to mention MCAT is still uh, hosting kids. Suggested age is 9 to 13 every Saturday here at 500 North Higgins in Suite 105. Between the hours of 1 and 5 p.m., you can drop your kiddos off here to do a little animation skit making there's an mm -hmm. example on the mm -hmm. screen for you right now legos do seem to rule the day <laughs> i guess because it's like pre-made for the imagination yeah but also just... people are doing drawing and they're doing some live action oh they are now cool oh, yeah, that doesn't take quite as much patience that. no <laughs> <laughs> so, um there is a fee associated with this until we move to the library right where we will enjoy free rent in perpetuity in Poipel, what? <laughs> That's what they because did we're said. your community access That's media it. center. Another activity we have is Spring Flicks at MCAT. This starts on uh, Monday, March 16th, and it is kind of designed to be a little bit of a substitute for school that week when school is closed. Right. Parents and caregivers. Not too early to start thinking the about school that. School is closed <laughs> March 16th through the 20th, the whole week. Um, and so you can bring your kids here. Um, they could get some pre-care beginning at 8.30, and they could stay till 3.30 with the post-care. And the activity blocks will take place, of course, in the morning and the afternoon with a luncheon break. Um, for more information, visit our Facebook page. Yeah. So that's all I have, really, for MCAT, other than we're on the countdown. This is yeah. our last January in the old Missoulian space. I know, space, every month now. In the old Missoulian loadout garage. Where it's in the past, people used to come, older guys would come and say, hey, I just want to look at the garage. That's where I used to get the paper when I had my <laughs> route in 1959. <laughs> so everything is just footprints in the sand, yeah. right? Just yeah. being Time washed away. So how about Humanities Montana? I just wanted to give, my message is also aimed at teens, actually, probably not our biggest demographic, but... Um, a heads up to families who might be listening that Humanities Montana uh, just got funding for a two-year, uh, $200,000 pilot project. Really? Congratulations. Yes, to engage teens with um, the tools of civic life. To uh, It's going to be partnership with the library. Wonderful. And with a community organizer we just hired who will, they'll help a group of teenagers, anyone show up and you can be involved starting in February. More information to come. We don't have dates yet. Mm. But any young people who are interested in making a difference in this community can show up to the library and work with a librarian and with a community organizer to research a problem that they choose themselves and then uh, research, become more knowledgeable about the underlying causes of the problem are, and then start making the steps, whether it's speaking before city council or tracking a piece of legislation through the legislator, legislature in Helena or uh, changing some sort of a building code, whatever it might be. Uh, we just want to give young people the tools they need to enact change. Oh, so, that's wonderful. I know. It's a really cool project, and we're very excited oh, about that, it. Congratulations. That sounds really great. While Kim was talking, you may have noticed you were looking at a website. That's um, humanitiesmontana.org, Humanities right? And right. People can learn more about it. And, and maybe tell kids. So are you saying you're looking for kids 9 to 13 or 13 no, well, to we're, 18? We're talking high school, I would say. Okay. So I would yeah, say, or, you know, I'd say 13 to 19. Precocious yes. middle schoolers. Yes. Don't lose heart. Kids who want to make a that. difference. Yeah. There oh, that's wonderful. When I did, you know, the artists in the schools in the mid-90s right. for MCAT, um, Katrina Kicking Rock she really wanted to make a change, and I brought her to Mayor Mike Cadis. See? And you know what she wanted to change? Curfew. <laughs> <laughs> that might be your project. That far, I have no problem I mean, with that. She was civic-minded. <laughs> I mean, you know, because we sometimes say this, don't we? 
when people are being lazy, we say the world is run by those who show up. Yeah. It's a nice, I'm going to hang on to that. Right. I'm not sure that's true, but it's a nice Plus, thing to think Plus, I about. can pretty much promise pizza at most meetings. Oh, so, so okay. There now you you're talking. Yeah. yeah. Well, our first guests are here. Thank you so much for taking the time. Judy and Kim are here from the Bonner Milltown History Center and Museum. And we've got a kind of cheat sheet for you. Judy <laughs> spent a l I'm going to share this with you, Kim, because you're an expert interviewer. But Judy <laughs> spent the time, see? Thank you. Yeah, so you, Judy, first, can you give us a little background about the museum, how long it's been around and where it is, and what the hours are, and just the basics? Love to. Um, we moved into our little space, which is in the Bonner Post Office building, right in downtown Bonner. Um, and we moved in there in November of 2009. And um, in well, the summer of 2008, Stimson had had a big sale, sold off all the equipment, mm -hmm. the mill was up for sale, and so um, through a series of things that had happened in the past, we realized, hey, we better see if we can find anybody who wants to help save these stories. And yeah. we found treasure trove of former mill workers who had had 30, 40, 50 year careers at the mill who yeah. were wanting to keep that alive. And so that's how we got started in Bonner itself. Um, and then we um, started about the same time, um, thanks to MCAT, you can actually go back and see the very first one, recording <laughs> our history roundtables. So it's been, what, uh, 11 years full of saved history, thanks to uh, thanks to the filming that has been done. Oh, that's well, great. and also you guys. Remember, I went and did a little video <laughs> about the History yeah. Museum, uh -huh. and who was, is it Rascal of, you know? <laughs> Hooligan. <laughs> Hooligan was there, and he's giving me a tour. And there are some fascinating things that people used to work with, or oh, yeah. I really recommend it. And then for the hours, too, sometimes, I don't know if you still do this, they say on the door, if nobody's here, call this number. <laughs> and if they're free, you know, they'll come down and yeah. show you around. Yeah. yeah. If you, uh, really recommend coming Tuesday mornings between 9, starts at 9 and can go supposedly till 11.30, maybe beyond, though, if the conversation's Who's good. ordering lunch? They have <laughs> cookies and great conversation oh, in the morning. And then we're also open Wednesday and Thursday afternoons from 2 to 4.30. And we don't offer, we have leftover cookies sometimes. <laughs> cookies. <laughs> They're not that bad. Um, and so, yeah, we welcome people or call us up. Yeah. I can't believe I've never been there. I have to get over oh, to can see you go it. Because I know the post office building is such a charming building. Yes. And so, yeah. 1942. And yeah. the history of Bonner and the Mill is fascinating. Mm -hmm. Super rich. Yeah. Super rich. Now, as part of um, programming that goes on in the museum, you have this series of roundtables. Is that right, Kim? Yes. Um, Three a winter, every third Sunday of, uh, of the month in January, February, and March. Mm -hmm. Usually, sometimes we alter that, but right. and that's the way it's going to be. This this uh, we we're, we're already through with our January roundtable. It was on Glacier Lake, Missoula. We had uh -huh. record attendance two Sundays ago, and um, and our next two are coming up in in February and March. What are the dates of those? Um, February 16th, I look at Judy here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I put him in for the lower thirds because it's the oh, third good. Sunday, isn't it? It's third Sunday. Oh, yes, right. I had to look okay. it up. Like, I lifted the calendar yes. forward, and I think Scott's got him. I'm squinting to see. Seems like March 15th. Mm -hmm. March February 15th, 16th, yep. and March 15th. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah. And the round tables are held at St. Anne's, is that correct? Most of them have been. Um, we are. Last year we started, a, I hope, a new precedent and had the one on uh, the Bonner bootlegging breweries and uh, bars at the new Kettle House tap room, oh, which had just opened last uh, um, a couple of months earlier. It was a wonderful event, so we've decided to try that again for our February roundtable, the oh, Kettle House great. tap room. Yeah. Now, what are the topics of the two that are coming up? The, the February one, Dan Hall, an archaeologist here in Missoula, oh, know, he will be talking about Captain Lewis's trip up the Blackfoot in 1806. And then in March, we have a direct descendant of 
Walter McLeod of Missoula Mercantile um, uh, okay. fame, Mar Mary Mulroney Pitch, is coming over from Helena to talk about um, the, the family trees that the McLeods and the Hammonds and other families that, that were basically the genesis of the, uh, of the Bonner Mill. Right. Um, besides the, the mercantile. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so she, she knew sh and knows a lot of the family histories of, of those that I don't. <laughs> yeah, because the notes say, you know, Mary Pitch of Helena is granddaughter of Walter McLeod, the successor to his father Herbert's presidency of the mercantile. Yeah. So that, you know, it's removed by just a few generations. Yeah, yeah. But since it's we amazing. only live so long, Right? When we're historians, we say, oh, 200 years ago, it means nothing. <laughs> when we're alive, when we say 20 years ago, yeah. oh, I feel it. <laughs> I really do. Oh, there's a question here. It says, what is Mary Pitch's connection to Bonner? Well, her, her connection isn't a direct connection. She's also the granddaughter of one of M Missoula's prominent lawyers in the early uh, 15, or 1900s, oh. um, Edward Mulroney, and so she has a lot of connections both on that side of the family and the McLeod oh, okay. side of the family, right. but her main connection is the McLeods who who were, uh, her great-grandfather, C.H. McLeod, was um, A.B. Hammond's right-hand man oh. and president of the Mercantile. Right. The Hammonds themselves w would have been in that family tree. Um, connection to Bonner is that Henry Hammond was actually the owner and operator of the mill in the 1880s and 90s. Oh, I didn't know that. I didn't either. I so always knew about the Hammond Arcade. Yeah, me and too. Right. You know, A.B. Hammond's stamp is everywhere, but yeah. his, his brothers, two brothers actually, um, are, are better known, I guess, as the, for their part in the Bonner Mill. Wow. Wow. So, and both of the, the February and the March events run from, did you say two to four on Sunday afternoon? Two to four, yep. Yeah. There's an important por in point in the notes. Mm -hmm. Because the March one, where did the road to the Buffalo go through Bonner and up the Blackfoot? February. That's February. That's, oh, that's the February? Yeah. Okay. And uh, one of the fun things about having it at the tap room is what I think is going to be revealed as the route, you can sit in the tap room and look right across the river and, and see, see the it. route. <laughs> right, well, oh. Meriwether Lewis on July 4th, 1806 was following up the Blackfoot, the, right. the road to the Buffalo, ages old trail that, oh. uh, that the, the natives used to follow to go to east of the mountains for the Buffalo. And so that was his natural route. Mm -hmm. And um, oh, that makes sense, doesn't it? Because people had already tread that route, so it was like, I well, mean, I'll go this way. Then. So many of the trails and stuff were, in, you know, originally created by Native Americans, and yeah, then, yeah. you know, why recreate that wheel? It has always been a question among us out there where they, how they could have gotten around the high cliffs that are across the river from the tap room, the kettle house tap uh -huh. room, and the mill. Um, and I think we've got the answer. Really? <laughs> to be revealed, um, you But go. you have to show yeah. up to yeah. find it. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> run the world. Dan, Dan has done a lot of studying, but also we have some, quote, old timers out there that have, have studied the question. And that really counts. I don't want to be digressive, but I was reading no. a thing about you know the old Milwaukee tunnel and that town over there that sort of grew up out of building the tunnel between Montana and Idaho on the old Milwaukee mm -hmm. rail and it was someone familiar with the area said you're way off they're looking for the cemetery yes. of the people and someone who knew it you know from having lived right. you know in the area was able to pinpoint them mm -hmm. to exactly. the cemetery yeah. Yeah. But what about this dinner? That's what caught my eye. See, so I got the dates mixed yeah, up. Yeah, you're yeah. going to head to March. No. <laughs> um, so the March um, topic is followed by St. Anne's famous Butte pasty hey, dinner. Yeah. Yes. Do you want to enlarge on that? Uh, <laughs> I do. Well, um, I should 
let Kim talk about it. He, he knows the history of the beginning of the past day dinner, too. Well, um, it, it is a fundraiser for the youth of St. Anne Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. um, and we started that. Um, I belong to the church. and So, so we started it, um, oh, many years ago. Our pastor at the time was from Butte, mm -hmm. <laughs> Father Mike Poole. And so we started this tradition of Butte pasties. We call them better than Butte pasties. <laughs> um, There's some chutzpah. <laughs> so is there, is there someone in the community who makes them better than Butte pasties, or are they from Butte? Father Poole comes out, <gasps> uh, has, has he's retired now, right. but he has continued to come out and, uh, and kind of spearhead the Making. people from the, peri the parish to... Uh, Oh, it's a long great. Saturday, the day before <laughs> Sunday. <laughs> and he's an exacting chef. I will. Yeah, yeah. I've heard oh. the story, so they are delicious. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm very really intrigued good now. To know. Yes. Well, we. I guess we better move along. But I want to make sure people are, are getting the overview as, as um, we finish up. The round tables are the third Sunday, and they're just January, February, and March typically yes. each right. year, and they're from two to five. Two to four, four, rather. Two to four. Mm -hmm. And then the, it's, it's going to be at the Kettle House Tap Room in Bonner in this upcoming February. Yeah. And then we'll be back at St. Anne's for March. March. Yes. Mm -hmm. And delicious cookies and refreshments Tuesday mornings yes. at the museum. Yes. Um, and check for other hours. What were the other hours? Wednesday again? and Thursday afternoons. Wednesday yeah. and so. Thursday afternoons. And, you know, I've got to tell you, if you guys are ever trying to embark on a project or a uh, and True. more programming. You should look at Humanities Montana for a grant. You know, now that you say that, uh, Kim headed up the um, Mullen Conference, oh. and we were looking for the connection of where we knew That's each right. other. So mm -hmm. that was I a few years, yes. and that was That's it. Right. So it I talked happened. to you about that. Oh, yeah. Oh, I bet. So we really appreciate that. There wow. it is. And okay. we appreciate your coming. I know we got to go, but I really. Yeah. Think. I'm so glad that you I'm hoping I can get to one of those talks. They both sound fascinating. They are fun. And yeah. then, in honor of their visit. Yes. Well, typically, you know, it's like a talk show format, so we've got to do something as we get you out of here and get the new people in or whatever. Well, I thought, why not show, because MCAT's undergoing a little navel gazing to move to the library. Right. We have 7,000 titles here recorded between, you know, 1990 and present day. So we've been looking through, I guess you do when you leave the house, right? Right. We're like going through old drawers. In any event, from 2008, I thought it would be nice, instead of the usual public service announcement till we were ready to go again, maybe show some of these vaulty clips okay. um, on f throughout the yeah. show. So this one, to set up the clip, dear patient viewer, <laughs> is the dedication of the, br the Black Bridge, I think it's called, the Bonner Milltown oh. Black Bridge from 2008. And in the clip, we've got some former uh, Missoula County Commissioners, Jean Curtis, and you'll see Bill Carey behind her. Mm -hmm. But also Mike Cooney was the state attorney general, right. and then he shows up. Somebody reads something from Denny Rayberg's crowd, and uh, John Tester is there, and Max Bacchus. Oh, cool. Can't wait to see it. Clip. Well, you're, you can look a little, and Scott, if you'll run it, we'll be right back with our next guests. On behalf of Missoula County, I would like to thank you for joining us this morning to commemorate the opening of the Black Bridge in Milltown. I'm Jean Curtis, Chair of the Missoula County Commission, and with me this morning are your other two commissioners, Commissioner Larry Anderson and, and Bill Carey. Isn't this a fabulous bridge? <laughs> yeah. And thanks to all of you who prayed for lovely weather because we couldn't ask for better. We have a lot of people who helped this, the reconstruction of this bridge a reality. Before I recognize the many contributors, I'd like to remind us of its history. The Steel Trust Bridge was built across the Blackfoot River in Milltown in 1921 and served as the state highway bridge until 1977 when the new highway bridge was built, which of course has now be been replaced. It was maintained as a pedestrian bridge from that time. 
The contractor in 1921 was a company called Security Bridge, and the main man on the job was W.P. Roscoe. The company who did the rebuild on the work on this bridge for Frontier was Roscoe Bridge, a unit of Roscoe Steel and Culvert, a Billings-based ba company owned by Jim Roscoe, the grandson of the original builder. The steel truss bridge is not what you would build today. There are cheaper and easier methods, but it holds a powerful place in our industrial history and in the aesthetic memories of local residents. Rather than simply replacing the old bridge or even scrapping it all together, the community pushed to have it rebuilt the old way. The new old black bridge is now bolted together rather than riveted, and it's now in place, and we are certain that WT WP Roscoe would certainly be proud of his grandson. And after we have the ribbon cutting across the bridge, we saved a bucket of rivets that are sitting back here in a bucket, so you're welcome to take one. When the old Milltown Dam, pro when the Milltown Dam project began, all the bridges in the area were studied in depth to see what the impact of dam removal would have on them. With the drawdown of the river reservoir, the bridge piers and abutments would be stressed by the Oh, we're back. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed that clip. That was uh, former County Commissioner Gene Curtis at the dedication of the uh, M Bonner Milltown Black Bridge. So that was like twelve a, years ago. Yeah, yeah. and a railroad bridge. You know that they turned yeah. it. They kept it. So I've been it on down. it. It's beautiful. And it's a pedestrian bridge. Mm -hmm. It's really nice. Well, Jake and Rebecca are here to talk about uh, Project Community Connect. Thank you for taking the time. Of course. So you. you mentioned this is the fourteenth annual iteration of this event, and you want to tell people a little bit about what it is. Project uh, Community Connect is open and free event. It's open to the community. And um, the idea is to present a one-stop shop for a, a mirage of services. So we can you know, help someone with, whether it's a free haircut, they can get um, some dental services, reading glasses, um, clothing, housing services. It's it's over the top and we have a new service this year that we wanted to share information on. What is it? <laughs> the title of it is Pathways to Justice and it is um, an opportunity if someone has uh, misdemeanor warrants they could address those. Oh, wow, that I mean, because issues like that so often prevent people from seeking other kinds of care that they that they need. Sure. Um, that's amazing. That is really amazing. And Jenny Miriam said something about it at a meeting earlier today, but can you enlarge on it a little? So there's actually going to be like a court opportunity at the event? At the event. So this year, um, this event will be taking place at Revive Church in, in the Valentine Center. And there is a space that has been set up and we're coordinating with um, Municipal Court and Justice Court. And um, the opportunity is that someone could come to the event, um, actually even before the event, the day before they could call in and we can share that phone number just to see if there are any fines out there mm -hmm. for them. Uh, but if they don't do that and they just show up to the event, they can do that uh, research and if they want to move to the next step they can go and, and go in front of a judge and get that addressed. Um, if they do come um, to the event they could possibly get a $20 credit towards their fines if they update their contact oh, wow. information. So that's, wow. so that's, so that's very progressive. Congratulations. Yeah. You know like in the New York area my family lives there and I was back for the holidays they're eliminating like a bail for misdemeanors, yep. you know, because so many people would get hung up not having a hundred, four hundred, five hundred dollars. Yep. Who's got that right. or the savvy to go to bail bondsmen and take ten percent? Pay outrageous, right? Yeah. So right. people, you know, stay in jail awaiting prison for minor offenses, costing the taxpayers yeah. yucky, yucky dollars a day, right. and losing their freedoms and getting exposed to God knows what trauma. So my hats off to that. That's wonderful. Thank you. Um, there's also what we call a uh, legal wellness checkup opportunity. So if you, if someone came in and they had questions um, there's actual staff um, that can help with SNAP, TANF, Medicaid issues, um, housing, divorce, uh, debt collection, safety at home and even their tax, wow, tax legal that's help. Really wow. That's really great. So in the past you know when it first started there was a lot of um, things for people that may be living 
in temporary housing, couch surfing, mm -hmm. living in the automobile for a period, just trying to pa patch it together. Um, and it sounds like the service has really evolved into a lot more. Definitely. It's really a good time. Um, there's been a number of special programming vouchers that have been issued, um, some through Missoula Housing Authority. And so the opportunity for someone to come to the event and learn about those programs and see where they might fit, um, it's, it would be a definite, definite good use of their time. Um, so it's a good opportunity right now. And then does it also address people that sort of at risk of homelessness, meaning, you know, some people, and you, you read about this all the time, like all of us are like one medical emergency right, away exactly. from the street, you know, and that kind of thing. So if people are living like paycheck to paycheck, or if they're older on a fixed income, and they're like, I'm not sure how long I can keep this up, are they invited to come in and, and get referrals and such? Definitely, definitely. We have, um, we will have employers there again. We'll have a number of training programs um, through the state on site as well. And if someone is looking um, maybe to learn about any special programming that could meet their needs, they're definitely welcome to come. So it's it's not um, exclusive, it's inclusive. <laughs> inclusive. Right. Yes. And Jake, you're here representing Western Montana Mental Health Care, their PATH program, yes, right? Are you in part of this? Yes, I am. Um, so I'm the service area coordinator for the mental health services. Um, so we are incorporating about 10 mental health providers within the community to come to the events and, you know, just talk about their services, offer them to the community. Yeah. We're offering, you know, on-site registration and enrollment for services as well. Um, Western Montana Mental Health will be able to provide appointment setting at that uh, event, um, which is very nice because it's, you go to the event, you can know when you leave that event when your appointment's going to be. Right. So it really kind of takes a lot of that legwork out of it, um, which is really great. And so I've been coordinating that effort and um, yeah, we're really excited. We're going to try and provide a um, mental health professional on site for any individuals that may be experiencing crisis during the event. Mm -hmm. um, they can take them to a private and confidential area where they can hopefully de-escalate that individual and just kind of talk about what's bothering them and provide some sort of crisis mediation. So we're looking to expand the mental health services that we're providing at the event um, to kind of serve any need that, that may be related to mental health issues. So That's great. The time, is it uh, still in the morning, like 10 to 2 or? It's this Friday from 10 to 3 p.m. 10 to 3. Yes. And then, Kim knows I have this. No, I want to know too in this case. The Latimer, like if people want to know how to get there, what right. would you tell them? Do, is the bus running there that day or yes. anything? <laughs> so the, we're, they're going to be offering free shuttles um, from two locations starting at 9.30, running every half hour. Okay, um, so they're going to be running from the Pavarello Center as well as First United Methodist Church. Yeah, um, which was the old, old, old home of the event, right? Correct. Yeah, yes. Right. 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 right across from yes. the public library, right? East Main. Very yep. savvy, yes, absolutely. So they will be running from 9.30, I believe, until 2.30 or 3.00. Uh, every half hour to and fro and so people can go to those locations if transportation is an issue and get direct um, transportation to that event so um, we're trying to just make it as easy as possible for any consumer or just you know um, Missoulian fellow Missoulian to, to come and, and enjoy in community conversation some free food and and talk with each other about services they may be looking for or um, things that they may need. So yeah. That's really great. And then I'll bet you needed lots of volunteers. Oh and my gosh, I can't even imagine how to, huge to bring this them is. In. It's huge. Um, we have been working with the volunteer coordinator and this event, just like every year, we do a huge outreach for, for volunteers. And so part of that volunteer process is to help with the point in time survey. And Jake? 
can you expand on that? Yeah, um, so the point in time count um, is an effort that's going on the night before that. So okay. from sundown to sun up, it's a nation and statewide effort that focuses on understanding homelessness a little bit more. Um, it is volunteer and service provider driven, and it's a anonymous, um, a voluntary effort used to kind of extract data uh, about homelessness within our community. And that data is used to acquire federal funding right. um, to be able to, to help these individuals suffering from housing instability. So we will be um, spearheading an effort that's happening Thursday evening from um, 6 to 8 in the courthouse yard. Uh, we're going to be providing uh, food and trying to um, initiate this survey for the people in downtown that, that may be suffering from some homeless instability. Um, so we really encourage anybody to come down to the courthouse this Thursday um, from 6 to 8. We'll be providing uh, food, um, hot coffee, uh, beverages. Um, there's going to be a warming shelter there for people to come and get um, receive the survey in a nice warm space. And then um, we also are part of the coordinated outreach team, which is um, a group of service providers within the community that will be going out to local encampments, areas mm -hmm. where we've identified maybe people are, are camping out to try and um, have them fill the survey out to really talk about their needs and um, maybe some issues that they're dealing with that has caused them to be housing unstable. And so um, to follow up with that, we're also going to be having a breakfast at First United Methodist Church from 6.30 to 10 on Friday morning also to be able to capture those folks in the morning too. So we really urge people to come to both of those efforts to enjoy in community conversation, some food, and be able to, to uh, serve those uh, suffering from housing instability. So. I think it's, it's really important to, you know, it, it's not that easy to get a clear picture sometime of the scope of a problem like this. And um, the clearer the picture you guys create is, the better chances for increased funding, the better uh, community groups can come together to find solutions. So yeah, they have to be counted first. <laughs> it is really difficult if the social sciences are just locked out yeah. of the whole issue. You know, and people know the census counts. Yes. And then, you know, people with unstable housing don't often figure in se census counting. And all of this stuff is politicized, you know, like like defining what the poverty level is is, mm -hmm. is a huge deal. Like, if somebody did it honestly, you'd find, oh, 30% of the nation is in poverty or whatever. But so that's very normal. Yeah activity as well. Well, I just, I can't even get my mind around what the planning and the organizational yeah. skills that are put to, to use in this that. project that every year. Really so congratulations work. on all your past work and, and good luck yeah, this time. 14th annual. The date again? This Friday, this the Friday, 31st. The 31st. And Last it's 2811 Latimer, which is out um, by the Pacific Recycling oh, yeah. in the building where the indoor soccer um, Oh, I didn't know oh, that was is. An indoor oh, I know where that is. Yeah. So it's okay. the Valentine Center, which is also houses Revive Church. That's right. Got it. right. Okay. Well, I'm sure you'll have a crowd. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Fortunately and Hopefully. fortunately. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. Well, thank you so thank much, you. Jake thank you. and Rebecca, for taking the time. Absolutely. So we're going to continue your clip, your look at the uh, dedication of the pedestrian Black Bridge in Milltown uh, Bonner, and we'll be back right after this. Thank you, Gene, very, very much. This is a great day. Everybody loves a bridge. <laughs> whether it's uh, throwing a log across a river or a creek, or whether it's uh, trying to build a little bridge, a little kid, or you know, this bridge here, driving across Golden Gate Bridge or anything, everybody loves a bridge. Bridges, bridges are just special. And uh, this bridge is especially special. It's, um, bridges not only cross streams and rivers, but Bridges are a mark of progress. They're sim symbolic of people working together. It's um, one side working with the other. That is a lot of power in a bridge. And this bridge here um, is linking different parts of this um, cleanup project here, the Blackport cleanup project. Uh, so that makes the restoration of this bridge 
a little more special. Um, I have a unique um, memory of this bridge, and I'm so glad this project is proceeding because not too many years ago, and I was in the then called the Missoula Bank Run, the 10K, some of you probably ran in it years ago. We started here at Bonner, and I remember going across this bridge for several years. And uh, one time going across this bridge, lo and behold, one of the fellows that I was running with fell down because it's like a funnel effect, you know, across the bridge here. And he was flat in his stomach, and the and I could see a great big black footprint on, a, on the back of his t shirt. <laughs> And so a bunch of us grabbed hold of the guy by the armpits and picked him up, and off we went. All of us had no idea how he finished or where he finished. But <laughs> we're just very happy. Well, that was teamwork working together. The, uh, it's also, I think, kind of interesting that um, in ancient Rome, uh, a high priest was called the chief um, bridge maker, um, or in Latin, uh, Pontifex Maximus. And um, it's also, I think, uh, fitting that. Here we have a new Pontifex uh, Maximus, and that's Tim Elsie. Yeah. And Tim, Tim's the guy that figured out how to do this. Because I had, you know, so many, um, I was just remarking on the clip, you know, that we haven't seen Max Bacchus in, in a goodly while. Right. And then later on, um, John Tester is there, and then uh, I'm pretty sure they saw Mike Cooney, you know, who uh, then was the attorney general for the state. Right. Well, in any event, <laughs> County Commissioner Dave Strohmeyer is here. Welcome. Thank you for waiting to be on the show. Yes, and for coming on. My pleasure. Yeah. And you're here to talk about a passion of yours, is that correct? It is one of many passions, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Trains. Trains, of course. And specifically course. passenger rail passenger service, rail. restoring that at least to the Northwest, or, or are you taking in like the nationwide picture? We are taking in the nationwide picture. So for those folks who have not been in Montana since the 1970s, what you may or may not know is that we had passenger rail service right here through Missoula yeah. and Missoula County up until 1979. It was called the North Coast Hiawatha, operated by Amtrak. And you could hop on the train at the north end of Higgins Avenue and travel to Minneapolis, Chicago, Portland, Seattle. 1979, right. that stopped. So over the past four decades, it's hard to believe it's been that long. Wow. There have been kind of waxing and waning efforts and attempts to try to get passenger rail service back through here. We're going to take another run at it, and we're going to try a few different uh, approaches to try to make that happen. And we figured that uh, Missoula County in the year 2020 ought to be at the tip of the spear of this effort, and right. that's where we are. So, I mean, I, one, one hears a lot of stuff about the dangers of air travel or, you know, the carbon footprint mm -hmm. and so on. Now, when people, uh, sometimes when they think of passenger rail, it's so far in their minds that they do see coal being <laughs> shuffled into an engine. But um, is it more um, or rather less detrimental to the environment? For instance, if you had the option to fly as you do, let's say, between New York and DC. Or then or each of us individually driving our cars. Yeah, or that, which yeah. a lot of us do. I drove solo to Great Falls to go to a funeral last weekend. That was about 340 right. miles, or I guess, round trip or something. But, but is part of the move, the, okay, so that's a good question. Why? We've got all these airplanes, they're out there building the multi-million dollar new airport. You know, is it, is it romance? Is it practicality? Is it convenience? Yeah, there are several reasons. <laughs> right. it, it's environmental. Yeah. It's uh, social in terms of social equity, providing a mode of transportation that we don't have now that provides mobility for folks who might not have a, any other mm, means to travel. Right. And, uh, and it's economic. So on the environmental front, yeah, trains, uh, they move a lot of uh, people and stuff. Uh, right. uh, we've got freight trains running through here right, right now. All and the time, it's not like it's broken. Clearly, yeah, they're true. still valuable for Ab absolutely. extractive and industries and other places. And so even though they, they do use fuel, and I would certainly hope that the trains of the future are not our great-grandparents' trains right. in terms right. of 
carbon footprint and I am excited to look at new technology that we might integrate into a revived passenger rail system. But uh, even right now with uh, diesel engines, there is an environmental aspect to that to uh, move a lot of uh, people and freight uh, uh, with a lesser carbon footprint than you would say with uh, airlines sure. or single occupancy vehicles sure. for that matter. Also, uh, in terms of social equity and providing opportunities, I got a phone call, uh, actually it was an email from someone over in Billings last week. This individual was visu is visually impaired, mm -hmm. can't uh, drive, uh, uh, does not want to fly, but would gladly uh, ride a train. And I think the same can be said for many others, students, veterans, uh, seeking oh, yeah. services, uh, elderly. My mom used to visit us up here, but we'd have to drive up to Whitefish to pick her up right. on the train up right. there. And uh, also, less, as we're talking about airlines, uh, let's not forget that good luck trying to get a connection within the state of Montana. Right. You can't oh, fly, no. interesting. You're going to no. you're gonna fly you to Denver, to right. Seattle, right. to Portland, and, uh, then to, and then back to Montana. Yeah. That's, if I wanted to go to Great Falls, you know, and, yeah, the, and, and the weather was kind. You know, let's say it was a blizzard and I want to go to this funeral, I would fly from Missoula to Salt Lake and then from Salt Lake or well, Seattle, you're right, to Great Falls. I know so many people in, in fields like mine in nonprofit world who travel. I've got a statewide organization. I'm traveling in state all the time and there's no other option than to drive my car. And um, and it's terrible. Yeah, because you get caught in blizzards I would such. much rather be in a train with a bunch of other people and I could be working, I could be, you know, instead of driving my car hanging for on for your hours. life right knuckling right. in this so it makes so much sense when i was in europe in october i mean that's just a way of life there nobody even thinks about it you take the trains everywhere yeah. but Dave, so what can, if people are watching right and they're like well this sounds really good especially you know i think back when i had first come to the state you know i go from new york to minneapolis and we stop in billings and we stop in great falls yes. and then you know it was like a milk run and then we come to missoula and you used to be able to you know say, I'm going to fly from Missoula to Great Falls or Missoula to Billings. If somebody wants to help you, what is it they can do to help this effort? Yeah, there are a few things. So what we're working on right now is trying to initiate an economic impact analysis, mm. uh, looking at what are the benefits to the state of Montana if rail is reinstituted. Too often in the past, the focus has just been on how much is this going to cost? Right. Or, how many train sets are we going to need? How much rail is needing to be improved? What's the dollar amount of, of that? But not looking at the economic benefits to the right. state. So we're looking at that. We're also wanting to have Congress update the 2009 feasibility study that was conducted uh, to take a look at this. Over 10 years old, outdated, many of the improvements that were recommended there have already been done. We need a fresh look at that. And uh, we're also looking at trying to establish uh, the first ever passenger rail authority in the state of Montana. Hmm. Uh, I'm calling it the Big Sky Passenger Rail Authority. <laughs> like and this is something that county commissioners in Montana have the authority to do. So this would be a, a government institution, uh, a governance structure that would, county commissioners would appoint the board of directors mm -hmm. for this authority. And this authority would be charged with the responsibility of trying to advocate for and push this initiative fo forward. So what can folks do? Contact our congressional delegation, right. our three members of Congress, our two right. senators, or one congressman, and ask them, uh, well, first off, just tell them if you think passenger rail is part of Montana's transportation future, let them know and urge them to update the feasibility study. If you're here in Missoula County, or more particularly, if you're outside of Missoula County along the proposed route, contact your county commissioners right. and local elected officials. They need to know because we need their partnership in helping make this happen. And basically the route, uh, and I mentioned earlier, this is not just a Montana thing, but mm -hmm. we're looking nationally. Yeah. So we're looking beyond the boundaries of Montana, east and west. So the old North Coast Hiawatha line basically traveled from Glendive through Billings, uh, Bozeman, yep. Butte, Helena, Missoula, and then over to Sand Point and points uh, west. It's basically what we're looking at here. Uh, the, the line may or may not go through Butte. 
Sorry, my friends oh. in Butte. Uh, <laughs> uh, not to say it couldn't it happen. A right. Where there's a will, uh, uh, there's a way, and where there's money, there's potentially a mm -hmm. way. But Homestake Pass has been out of service for decades, uh. and it could be reopened, but would require a significant. You mean the investment. rail line? The rail line. Yeah, you, you can, can still drive. It. You, you can, can see it. You it, can it see would it. be a beautiful drive. Yes, it would. But uh, it requires a significant amount of work. Right. right. And you know, once one gets to the coasts. There is a passenger rail service like Seattle, oh, yeah. you know, Portland, and down. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, I grew up on the East Coast. We routinely take still, the train to D.C., right. to Philadelphia, to Providence, Rhode Island, or Boston. Mass, yeah, you know. totally. And you have a great example of how successful this can be just looking to the north with the Empire Builder yeah. along right. the High Line. on the High Line. One of the most popular uh, and heavily uh, ridden uh, yeah. long-distance trains in the country. Yeah. And is that the only rail that goes through, uh, passenger rail that goes through Montana at this point? It is. Yeah, yeah. the only one. So you have to go to Whitefish, yep. you know, to enjoy yep. that. I've always meant to do it. And, and you know, you mentioned a sleeper car, I think, before we came on. Like, were you able to sleep in that sleeper car? Yes. Wow. Yes. It seems so romantic. It's well, you know, and right. the night on the train. So I heard from an aerospace company CEO over in Bozeman here recently how he would love this to be an option so he and his employees who are traveling for work can actually do work, you can work. Yeah. while you're traveling. Instead of Good doing luck this. doing that in one of those right. aluminum cylinders flying right. through the air. Yeah. So. Right. No, there, it's it's so much more appealing. Oh, and, I hope uh, it gets some. Um, I don't want to say legs. So I hope it gets some wheels. <laughs> no, uh, some all steam. aboard! Uh, <laughs> but it's it's going to be a, a a joint effort, and yeah. all of us in Montana need to make our voices heard loud and clear. And uh, if we can put someone on the moon 50 years ago, we can figure out how to okay. improve our transportation in Montana yeah. right now. Is there any online source of inf more information for people if they're interested? You know, at this point, we this do not have anything days. up uh, online. Uh, there is the uh, National Rail Passengers Association that okay. is a group that I've been working with on this uh, effort. We hope to host a passenger rail summit here in Missoula oh. sometime this spring. We, we hosted one over in Billings in October for oh, cool. the southeastern part of the state. We hope to repeat that in the spring just to get the word out and, and rally support for the effort. Great. That's great. Or people can just call you, right? People can call <laughs> me. Uh, my office is at 199 uh, West, West Pine. Pine. So, yeah. uh, or send me an email. Go and, see Dave. Uh, yep, absolutely. Come on out. We better go, I know. But Dave, thanks so much for taking thanks. the time. What a great to project. This. And You're... the work on it, too. Yeah. It's exciting. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, good luck. You bet. We'll be right back. We're continuing our plunge into the past, the dedication of the uh, um, East Missoula Bonner right. uh, Black Bridge. And we'll be right back with Matt from Missoula Community Theater right after that. I have to say, I really like it. Thank you, Gene. Uh, you know, I, I kind of came late to this dance. I was in the state legislature when, when, when a lot of the, the planning was going on to this, and we had our impacts there. But I will tell you, as a, as a U.S. Senator, I get to do a lot of fun things. There's nothing more fun than than uh, uh, infrastructure improvement projects. And, and the folks I want to recognize first is those outstanding eighth graders in the very back. Yeah. Yeah. The outstanding eighth graders and their peers will be able to use this for, uh, for literally their entire lifetimes and hopefully their kids and kids as kids beyond that. And I also want to thank uh, Senator Max Bacchus for being able to step up the plate and get some highway dollars for this. Governor Schweitzer for being able to step up the plate and get some state dollars for it. Mike McGrath to the NRD and, and the EPA. John, thank you very much, all you guys. But most importantly, I want to thank the community of Bonner. And, and Gene read through the list of folks that, that had the, their fingerprints on this project locally. And I think that it is absolutely incredible how this community has stepped up to the plate to be able to make this bridge a, a workable uh, a workable unit once again. And I want to. Who do I need to talk to about some partnership program? Oh, we're right back. We, oh. You could tell. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we, oh, sorry. <laughs> I, I can't because it's not official. I can't oh, do oh, okay. good, good, Future good. plans. Well, yeah. <laughs> dear viewer, you, you somehow surprised us. We didn't see you, we didn't see you over there. Right. Um, Matt Lurkey is here. Yeah. He is with the Missoula Community Theater. Matt, thank oh. you so much for taking the yeah, time. Yeah, my pleasure. Oh, you could put your mic on too. Oh, uh, sorry. I mean, yeah. Just double. It's just double, that's yeah. it. Okay. The other one will pick you up with that. 
Okay. So, you as usual, you guys have a million great things going yes. on. What what rises to the surface right now, most immediately? Well, let's do the calendar year, because that'll help out. Yeah. So, uh, this next weekend is our closing performance, or weekend, of Leading Ladies, the Missoula Community uh, Theater. Raves uh, yeah. Play, farce, comedy, uh, of mistaken identity, with a little bit of love, and all of that thrown in there. It's PG-13, so think before you go, but do get your tickets. It's selling quite well. Yeah, it's cool. a great good laugh on these gloomy days we've been having lately right. and then the very next weekend with the children's theater february 6th to the 8th is frozen junior oh, oh yes my God. You let are it go going to be back to the <laughs> yes we one. are yeah. <laughs> 38 amazing students from around the area no adult performers all of them performing uh, about an hour 15 musical based on the first movie not the mm -hmm. second movie yeah. or anything like that um, it's been incredible we've been working with them since before the holidays wow. uh, then after that the spitfire Grill opens from the Missoula right. Community Theater. It's a musical, but it's not a song and dance musical. Yeah. It's um, about seven people, and it's a tale of uh, renewal, small town, new beginnings, all of that. Uh, it's going to be a great one as well. Again, kind of in the PG-13 area, so think right. before that. And then Winnie the Pooh is coming up with a whole bunch of child actors in April. Our spring break day camp with Beauty Lou and the Country Beast. And then we close our season with the Community Theater with Matilda, oh, which wow. is... Uh, uh, you know, based on the Roald Dahl book and the Broadway musical, which just the rights came out and many theaters are doing them. And we're one of the first in Montana to yeah. do it. Uh, uh, Grand Street's going to be doing it as well in Helena. So it's very fun. Oh, it's so full. Yeah. And, um, so I want to highlight, you know, because we are doing the, the spring flicks, that you guys will also have activity for kids during spring break, March 16th through the 20th. Correct, yeah. And uh, for us, that's um, Beauty Lou and the Country Beast is one of our tour shows, those iconic yeah. shows that go in the trucks and travel around the nation and all of that. Right. And so we have up to 70 students who can register for that. And they're at MCT from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Monday through Thursday, learning to put on the show and doing other activities. And then on Friday, they have performances at 4 and 6 on March 20th. Oh, cool. So whether you have a student in the show or looking to do something with your child, mm -hmm. then come and check that out. Yeah. yeah. Um, Scott's showing the viewers at home awesome. the website. So I bet people could register, you know, for the camp there, but also to take in the whole calendar season. Correct. You know, um, yes. Through the summer. And uh, something to put on your calendars, which I'm sure you'll all be coming up with as well, is our sp summer camps will register right. the first Friday of March. Wow. And it's great Whoa. to throw that out there because our summer camps do sell out. They really do. Um, I've, had, I've uh, talked to disappointed parents <laughs> in the past. So, yeah, get on it because March is right around the corner. It is. And that always happens around there. And then also put in your hats starting in May is actually our 50th season with MCT. Wow. And so I should say June 1st. That's our calendar year for us starts wow. June 1st oh, over on that. Yeah. So we have been doing a lot of planning behind closed doors about how to honor our history and celebrate the future. And there's going to be a lot of extra events, opportunities mm -hmm. as we step into our new, I don't know how you call that, next decade, half century or yeah. how whatever you call uh, to go into 50. Centennial. Centennial. <laughs> so sesqua Centennial is 150 years. You're yeah. Sesqua. Sesqua? Just take one word out, I guess. <laughs> sesqua Centennial. <laughs> sesqua. Well, 50 or years. Quintennial. Yeah, yeah. Quintennial, that's I better. Don't know. Can, that's amazing. Yes. Congratulations. And so we're very excited to share that with the community yeah. and have that involved, not only wow. here in our town, but with all the communities we serve yeah. around the world. It's going to yeah. be quite exciting. Oh, that's really great. <laughs> oh, I can't wait for that, those celebrations. Yeah. I'm sure there'll be a lot of really cool Indeed, things. Indeed, yeah. Going on. I know it's horrible, but we do have to go. We're going to give five minutes. We're so no, 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 it's okay. okay. We, do. Come we back spend too much time with the come first guest. That's camp all right. Or summer camps or whatever Definitely. you want, Please. and we'll put you up first. And Thank then we'll you so go much. into that collaboration thing, too. I think yeah. so, indeed. Okay. <laughs> As it hidden before if someone caught us. Yeah. <laughs> Matt, thank you so much for taking the time. So here's your last little bit. We're actually turning historical again. Jesse Rogers is here uh, from the Historical Museum at Fort Missoula. Going to learn a little bit about that right after this. It really is a pleasure to be here and be part of this. As everyone has said, this really has been a team effort. And what it is, is it's a commitment to this community. This community uh, has been through a lot and will continue to go through a lot. Uh, this is a massive construction project. It is a uh, project that has the potential to alter the way of life of this community. And people have been concerned about it, uh, but at the same time enthused and cooperative. Uh, it really has been 
uh, a community endeavor maybe for 20 years. Uh, and I think culminates with the, the commitment to uh, rebuild and uh, open this bridge. Uh, this is, is a symbol, of course, of the community coming together, but it also is a commitment, as I said, to this community to allow children to safely go back and forth uh, for generations to come. And thank you all. Thank you, everyone that's here uh, for your work on this. We very much appreciate it. Thank you. part of the funding package was from the United States Environmental Protection Agency, EPA. So EPA matched that $975,652 grant and um, Montana's director You say that on camera. Oh, we're yeah. back already. So, <laughs> I'll just point out you saw Mike Cooney there last. He's I know. running for governor. So Jesse Rogers is here. She's development director for the Historical Museum at Fort Missoula. Welcome and thank you for waiting. Of course, thank you so for having me. So we were just talking about right. this exhibit, and I I already forgot how to pronounce it again. I believe it's Leaser's. Okay. Leaser's footsteps. Footsteps. Leaser's footsteps. New exhibit on Jewish history. And then in, in quotes you have uncovered. Yeah, so what's fascinating about this part of our history is it's very little known. And so Bert and Paul, who put this together and in conjunction with Ted Hughes, our curator, really had to go and dig deep. So they went directly to the descendants of these amazing men and families to uncover the archival materials, the photos, the stories they interviewed. It took so long to really build this type of exhibit, which is about the history of the Jewish community of Missoula and Western Montana. And it's absolutely fascinating and especially vital right now in this yeah. time of our history. We need to be talking about the different cultures and the different groups of people who make America what it is. Absolutely. And I know now, yeah. when you say Bert and Paul, tell us a little bit more about who they are. Or is it one person named Bert and Paul? No, <laughs> no. <laughs> it's, it's Bert uh, Chesney and Paul... <laughs> I'm, okay, I've maybe got, not. I've yeah. got so many names rolling through my mind right, right now. But these are two people who just did it because of a passion for the topic and because of their own background. Exactly. And Paul is actually a graphic uh, designer. A designer, mm -hmm. and I have seen the the plaques, and mm -hmm. they're spectacular. They really are. Between Bert, he did a lot of the actual interviewing and a lot of the digging into the history Research, of this. Yeah. And Paul brought his, as you say, you know, that forte of being able to design something that is aesthetic pleasing and just makes it flow and these are huge panels right yeah. so most of the exhibit will be up by the end of the month but we've had to revise a few for the location that they're in and so 99% of the exhibit will be open by the end of the month and then there'll be a few additions that will come in the week after but they're eight feet tall yeah four feet wow. plus wide and we were really trying to make the aesthetics of it resonate with the Jewish community and that culture. Right. So it's going to be a really interesting way that we're going to adapt tape Ad, adapt them <laughs> to walking to in your space to yeah. our space yeah yeah and the, and the stories go from some of the founders of Missoula mm -hmm. Leeser was the first Jewish man to right. move here and he basically started and helped build the downtown uh, district and you know without these amazing people yeah, a lot of things wouldn't happen. No, we wouldn't have our Missoula the way we know it. Through to through to like the great literary critic Leslie Fiedler, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and they found a really fascinating connection between early Jewish settlers and the Salish. Yes, correct. Correct. Interesting. I no, did not know that. Uh, Sam Bigarm, I believe, mm -hmm. and uh, Leeser. Uh, there, there's so many correlations and connections in how these two cultures came together to really build up of what Missoula was and the different trading operations, the different ways that there were so many 
cross segments that no one knew about. Right. And that's what's really fascinating yeah. and why, you know, over the next few months, we really want people to kind of stay connected with us because we are building toward having some workshops, lectures, some different tours, have Bert and Paul there and some other different folks who would like to come in and talk about their part of this exhibit. That's so great. Right. And the exhibit opens January 31st, 31st. this Friday. Open but through as you May. mentioned, you're going to be building on it. Yep, there'll be yeah. some edits and, and things to add on, you know, how it goes when you're building things that are eight feet tall right. and stuff. Well, once you have programming in place, I hope you'll come back and tell us about we some We definitely of that. will. And we also have a quick uh, segment into another part of different cultures of Missoula, and that is the 25th Infantry. So oh, wow. during the 1800s, many of you all know the 25th Infantry Black Bicycle Corps right, yeah. started here and did all the testing of the Spalding bikes and then rode all the way to St. Louis. We have a, a exhibit about it, but we've really been able to enhance it. So coming in February, February will be debuting a new update to the exhibit, oh, which is good. a lot more about the personal stories of some of the men who made that magnificent, crazy 1,400 mile yeah. bike ride yeah. on single <laughs> action bikes. In the late 19th century. Yep. Yeah. So it's pretty right. cool. So I, know, I know we bet. How much time do we have, Scott? Any? Gone. Zero. Zero. <laughs> it's so. gone. Well, I, we know you. you'll come back, Jesse. Yes. We get to see you a lot. So come back and tell us more about both those great news. And you'll be number one. Yeah. Woohoo! <laughs> <laughs> Lovely as always. Thank you. Thanks. As you are too, dear patient viewer, um, we will be back uh, next in two weeks on February 4th. As always, if you know of a group and you want to see them on the show, give us a call at MCAT. The number is 542-6228. For MCAT, I'm Joel Baird. And I'm Kim Anderson. We'll see you next time.